Hello friends. So, Paul Morn, a well-known Marxist on the site, uploaded a video titled, Is China Imperialist? And I'm going to spoil the ending for you all, he declares that it isn't. I believe Morin's heart is in the right place, as he attempts to make a Marxist analysis of the situation at hand, but I believe he makes some mistakes along the way. This video is not made to disrespect Morin. Although I don't agree with him, I think he's a respectable person. However, Morin, if you are watching this and are convinced, I would ask that you either remove your video or openly self-criticize in a future video. Morin begins his analysis in a correct manner, outlining that Lenin's analysis of imperialism is the only correct and scientific understanding of it. Morin then reads Lenin's summary of imperialism. Its five basic features are 1. The concentration of production and capital has developed to such a high stage that it has created monopolies which play a decisive role in economic life. 2. The merging of bank capital with industrial capital and the creation, on the basis of this finance capital, of a financial oligarchy. 3. The export of capital, as distinguished from the export of commodities, acquires exceptional importance. 4. The formation of international monopolist capitalist associations which share the world among themselves. And 5. The completion of the territorial division of the whole world among the biggest capitalist powers. In short, imperialism is monopoly capitalism. The free competition of the good old days of earlier stages of capitalism is past, and now monopolies are its dominant, distinguishing feature. Also, as a side note, directly after stating this, Morin says, And what's the purpose of this? To exploit and deliberately deter development in other nations in order to create dependent relationships which ensure long-term sources of income or other resources for the monopolists. Although this is mostly correct, there is a central part of this which isn't. The notion that imperialism deliberately deters development within the subject nations is demonstrably false. Lenin states in the fourth chapter of Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism, quote, The export of capital is made possible by a number of backward countries having already been drawn into world capitalist intercourse. Main railways have either been or are being built in those countries. Elementary conditions for industrial development have been created, etc. The need to export capital arises from the fact that in a few countries, capitalism has become overripe, and, owing to the backward state of agriculture and the poverty of the masses, capital cannot find field for profitable investment." End quote. It is perhaps possible for the imperialist bourgeoisie to keep these subject nations at a similar or stagnant point in development if they are without competition. However, once competition between two opposing imperialist nations begins, the exacerbation of resource extraction becomes critical, and the development of the sturdy infrastructure required to do that becomes pivotal. Morin then spends a significant amount of his video detailing the differences between Chinese loans and American loans. I want to get something clear. China cancelling debt is not a benevolent action. They have other ways of returning their investments, usually by immensely hiking up prices for the designs, the engineering services, the use of equipment, the supply of construction materials, the contracting of Chinese labor, and so on. But what Morin doesn't seem to understand, and in fact what many people don't seem to understand, is that the loans themselves and how they are conducted do not matter. Are we really going to sit here and believe that China desperately needs Mozambique to pay off its debt? Or that America will crumble if Chad doesn't return its investments? No, these economies are insignificant. The money was never the goal. American loans are usually designed to trap foreign economies in debt. What happens after that? As a method of repaying debt, America seizes foreign assets. And into that company comes a new McDonald's, a new Coke bottling plant, and a new Nike shoe factory. For China, the story is different. They don't need to trap foreign economies in order to expand into new markets, because once China signs the infrastructure contracts with that other country, the companies have already moved in. And they stay there. There are currently around 10,000 Chinese-owned firms currently operating in Africa, which have a combined value which is larger than 51 
of the 54 economies in Africa. The money was never the goal. The goal was to export capital, which America and China have both done flawlessly. Morin admits this, stating that, now, we have to concede Lenin's third characteristic of imperialism, that China does give great importance to the export of capital rather than just commodities. Though it certainly doesn't do this to subjugate the countries that it invests in and create states of dependency, like Western imperialist powers do. Though I'm at a loss as to how China can extract vast quantities of important natural resources such as cobalt, export vast quantities of capital to Africa, and operate those firms which are more wealthy than 94% of the countries on the continent, and not subjugate those economies or create states of economic dependency? Is it because China doesn't blatantly and openly force African countries to change their domestic and foreign policies? Because, and I'm sorry Paul, but that's not a prerequisite for imperialism. China, though not allowing most African economies to default on their loans, does in fact force countries into unpayable debt through the aforementioned price jacking. A link to a more thorough explanation will be in the description. Paul Moran then goes on to claim that As for the other four characteristics, private monopolies don't play a decisive role in Chinese economic life. Look up the anti-monopoly law of China. As we saw recently with how the CPC was able to shut down the country in response to the pandemic at the click of their fingers. Compare that to how Western governments had to negotiate with big business to enact their responses. How such countries have relaxed their lockdowns in order to serve economic interests rather than the interests of public health. In China, business answers to the government. In the US, the government answers to business. First of all, let's address the so-called anti-monopoly laws of China. While it's true that there are laws which restrict the activities of private enterprise in such a way that monopolies aren't supposed to be able to exist in China, the same laws exist in the United States. They are antitrust laws. But I think that Morin, in his rush to point out the anti-monopoly laws of China, has glazed over what a monopoly is. See, monopolies need not express themselves in the form of a single overbearing enterprise, and doing so represents its own risks and rewards. Monopolies may also express themselves purely in the form of monopoly capital, in which a cartel-like arrangement has been made between various individual enterprises, causing them to either act like or form into a single entity. It is this cartel-like arrangement of the largest enterprises that transforms capitalism into capitalist imperialism. To quote Lenin from Chapter 1 of Imperialism, the High Stage of Capitalism, quote, Thus, the principal stages in the history of monopolies are the following. 1. 1860-70, the highest stage, the apex of development of free competition, monopoly is in the barely discernible embryonic stage. 2. After the crisis of 1873, a lengthy period of development of cartels, but they are still the exception. They are not yet durable. They are still a transitory phenomenon. 3. The boom at the end of the 19th century and the crisis of 1900-03, cartels become one of the foundations of the whole economic life. Capitalism has been transformed into imperialism. End quote. While Morin is technically correct when he states that private monopolies don't play a decisive role in Chinese economic life, that does not mean that there is not a cartel-like arrangement of monopoly capital. Of the 25 largest companies in China, 24 of them are either state or government owned, with the only exception being Huawei, which is a private company. Interestingly enough, within the anti-monopoly laws which Morin rushed to point out, it is stated explicitly in Article 7 that the state is allowed to fix the prices of state-owned enterprises and is in fact the only entity which is legally allowed to do so. Quote, With respect to the industries controlled by the state-owned economy and concerning the lifeline of the national economy and national security of the industries implementing exclusive operations and sales according to law, the state protects the lawful business operations conducted by the business operators therein. The state also lawfully regulates and controls their business operations and the prices for their commodities and services so as to safeguard the interests of consumers and promote technical progress." End quote. 
even more interestingly, here's what Lenin had to say about cartels. Quote, Cartels come to an agreement on the terms of sale, dates of payment, etc. They divide the markets among themselves. They fix the quantity of goods to be produced. They fix prices. They divide the profits among the various enterprises, etc. End quote. Morin makes the claim that China doesn't have a private financial oligarchy. If it did, it wouldn't regularly be imprisoning and in many cases executing wealthy industrialists. But this, of course, does not explain what the financial oligarchy is, nor why it forms, nor actually why China wouldn't have one. We will take from chapters 2 and 3 of Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. Quote, The principal and primary function of banks is to serve as the middlemen in the making of payments. In so doing, they transform inactive money capital into active, that is, into capital yielding a profit. They collect all kinds of money revenues and place them at the disposal of the capitalist class. As banking develops and becomes concentrated in a small number of establishments, the banks grow from modest middlemen into powerful monopolies having at their command almost the whole of the money capital of all the capitalists and small businessmen, and also the larger part of the means of production and sources of raw materials in any one country and in a number of countries. This transformation of numerous modest middlemen into a handful of monopolists is one of the fundamental processes in the growth of capitalism into capitalist imperialism. End quote. Quote, On the other hand, the bank is forced to sink an increasing share of its funds in industry. Thus, to an ever greater degree, the banker is being transformed into an industrial capitalist. This bank capital, i.e. capital in money form, which is thus actually transformed into industrial capital, I call finance capital. Finance capital is capital controlled by banks and employed by industrialists. End quote. Finance capital is essentially when liquid capital, which is money, is loaned out by the monopolistic banking associations as investments to monopolistic industrial enterprises, which completes the merging and coalescence of the banks with industry. So then, does China in fact have a huge and monopolistic banking association which is also merged with industrial capital? Wouldn't you be shocked to hear that it does? Of the top 25 largest companies in China, 5 of them are banks, all of which are state owned, such as the China Development Bank, the Bank of China, the Agricultural Bank of China, the China Construction Bank, and the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China which is the largest bank in the entire world in total assets. I'm not going to lie to you, Paul. I have no idea where the execution of wealthy industrialists is supposed to fit into this, nor how it undermines the existence and expansion of finance capital and therefore a financial oligarchy. Not only this, but my good friend and comrade, Austrian Maoist One, pointed out to me that the execution of wealthy industrialists and bankers is not, in it of itself, a revolutionary or even anti-capitalist action, as similar actions have been taken under all fascist regimes, such as the expropriation and extermination of Jewish bankers and business owners under the Nazi Reich. This is not to say that the expropriation and elimination of capitalists and bankers is an inherently fascist action, but that it must be substantiated by a revolutionary goal to overthrow the whole capitalist system in order to be a progressive action. For the last two points that Lenin makes on imperialist capitalism, Morin simply states that they don't happen. It's not engaged in the formation of private international monopolist capitalist associations which share the world among themselves. It's not territorially dividing up the world like Western imperialists did in Africa and Latin America. He states that China isn't forming international monopolist capitalist associations which share the world amongst themselves, and that China isn't involved in the territorial division of the whole world. However, Moran does not provide an explanation as to why he believes this. What does forming international monopolist capitalist associations which share the world amongst themselves mean? As Lenin reiterates a few sentences after where Moran is quoting from, he states that it is when the division of the world among the international trusts has begun. 
Has China engaged in this? Yes, Chinese banks such as the Bank of China and its subsequent bank capital have branches across Africa where, quote, Right now, you could say that any big project in African cities that is higher than three floors or roads that are longer than three kilometers are most likely being built and engineered by the Chinese. It is ubiquitous, end quote. How is China involved in the territorial division of the whole world? Truthfully, territorial division has become something which is difficult to accomplish ever since colonialism became an international taboo. However, that does not mean that you can't carve up a sphere of influence which relies on you and views you as a positive influence, therefore viewing your imperial rival less and less favorably. While it's true that China does not typically engage in the neo-colonial practice of forcing policy changes on subject nations, it doesn't need to, and so it doesn't want to. A specific brand of neoliberal capitalism which drives the United States necessitates that all borders remain open for business, whereas the state capitalism of China does not, because China's economic development 40 years ago was on par with Africa. China's form of economic integration is therefore more suitable for the conditions of post-colonial Africa, and therefore does not demand many changes, if any, from their subject nations. However, from maps of foreign economic investment and popular support, clear-cut borders are being established regarding the economic and political division of the whole world between the United States of America and the People's Republic of China. So. Is it fair to say that China is imperialist? Well, let's refresh ourselves on Lenin's criteria. The concentration of production and capital has developed to such a high stage that it has created monopolies which play a decisive role in economic life. Yes. The merging of bank capital with industrial capital and the creation on the basis of this finance capital of a financial oligarchy. Yes. The export of capital, as distinguished from the export of commodities, acquires exceptional importance. Yes. The formation of international monopolist capitalist associations which share the world amongst themselves. Yes. The territorial division of the whole world among the biggest capitalist powers is completed. Yes. Paul Morin, China is an imperialist country. Thank you.